People, we normally get through our services in an hour or so. That's fine. Welcome and good morning. Today we're going to look at this topic of honest to God. Genesis and I were at a, at a marital uh, marriage conference yesterday. I started Thursday and then I watched it online on Thursday. Genesis was physically there and then yesterday we both got out together and man, it was, a, it was an intense thing because of the story um, that this couple shared, the, the couple that was leading it. Um, it was like an uncomfortable story at, at like Thursday um, when they first like started talking about like their story and um, maybe Jen can share about it later. But but then as as yesterday, like the first session went by, I was like, it was sort of like the culmination of their story. There was like infidelity in the marriage and there was like the sticking it out together. Um, and then like in the first session, they concluded with just being basically saying, hey, our story is... You know, one of the spouses cheated, had a child by someone else, and then we stayed in the marriage, and we pursued the marriage, and it hurt, and it felt like horrible times. Um, and then the first one forgiven, or that felt free from what they had done, was the person that, that did the, the infidelity, that committed the infidelity. Um, and the other mate felt like that's not fair, because they're the ones that wronged, and I did it. And then basically the conclusion of it all was, well, the gospel isn't fair. It's, it's a bunch of people that are guilty. It's a bunch of people that did wrong that are actually forgiven and loved by Jesus. And so it rocked my world. And then, um, and then there's this. There's, there's honest to God. Um, again, last week I talked about how Christianity is not something we do. Christianity is something we are. Christianity is not something that you refer to on Sundays, but something that goes within Monday through Saturday. Christianity is not something that turns on and then you turn it off when you're going to enter into a sinful situation. That's not how it works. Christianity stays on, period, even through your sinful situation. Um, because I said the reason for that is not that you deserve it or that you earn it, but that because God isn't flaky. God doesn't walk out on you when things go bad. God doesn't walk out on you when you're in the midst of the worst decisions of your life. Just like he doesn't walk out when you are making everyone around you proud. And so we're secure. And we're safe. But being honest to God, understanding being honest to God has to do with you knowing that God is not riding out on you when things go south. And so we're going to look at this, this example of this man in uh, Psalm 51. So if you would open up to Psalm 51 with me. You know, you guys know the story of David. Um, you know, Goliath is probably the first thing that comes to mind when you, when you think about David. And then if, you're, if you know the whole story, then after Goliath, it's Bathsheba. That's who you think about when you think about David. Um, Bathsheba was the woman that David uh, committed adultery with. And he didn't stop there. He went out and, and ordered a, uh, a, uh, a death order on Bathsheba's husband when he was uh, basically almost caught or before he got, uh, every, anyone knew about the situation. Um, and then there's a prophet, his name is Nathan. And Nathan is sent by God to tell David, hey, you think you fooled, you think you fooled everybody, and you might have. No one will know that you're the one that put the hit out on Bathsheba's husband, but God knows. And David just like has, like imagine, right? Like imagine you think you're keeping a secret so well, and someone says to you, you thought you fooled everyone. But someone knows. And they bring it out to light. I mean, I could imagine David's heart fainting and feeling like, wow, this is, this is probably one of the worst things that has happened to me. And in the midst of that, David writes this song, Psalm 51. So I'll read it out loud for you guys. And read it along with me if you've opened up your Bible. And David says, Have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfading love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Verse 2, wash me clean from my guilt. There was guilt. You murdered someone. You slept with someone else's wife. There was guilt. And David is confessing it. And he says, purify me from my sin. God, I committed it. I did it. I, I messed up. And there is no getting over my feelings. There is no getting over my sin. I am unable to do that. But I cry out to you. 
the one being that I sin against that has the power to judge is the only one that you can refer to and go to for the forgiveness of that very sin. And David knows this, and he says to him, for I recognize my rebellion. It's so important. And we'll talk about honesty before God with this verse. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. God, this is all up to you. I acknowledge my wrong. I know that I, I've messed up. And I'm begging for forgiveness. But ultimately, whatever you choose to do, God, if I have to pay for this one, David says to God, you're right for whatever you choose to do. Because I've sinned against you, the only one that has the power to forgive and to judge is you. And though I'm begging for forgiveness, though I'm begging for mercy, whatever you choose to do, God, it's what's right. Imagine, and this is what honest to God means, imagine having a heart towards God that says, dude, I know you can forgive me. I know you gave your son for my sin. But I also know that you are righteous, that you are upright. And if that one day I have to pay my dues for what I've done, I'm not even going to be mad at you. I can't even be mad at you because you're a right God. And let's read on. This is his approach to us. Talk about honesty. He says, you will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is judge. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb. Teaching me wisdom. Even there. Think about the whole picture. You're found out. It feels terrible. But knowing God and being honest to God and understanding that Christianity is something you are, not something you do, will bring you back to that creator, that same God that could call a judgment on you. Knowing Him for real is what takes you back to Him. And never, ever think that you have to run away from Him. This is being in Christ. Last week we talked about being in Christ. That's what this means. And Psalm 3 verse 1, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to it. But the first thing you have to understand about being honest to God is this. Be honest to God in your fears. God, this thing just rocks my mind. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm afraid of this. I used to be afraid of earthquakes. I used to be afraid of sleeping alone. I used to be afraid of the dark. Shoot, I'm still afraid of the dark some days. I think about it twice before heading to the bathroom. I mean, if you live in the neighborhood that I live in, it's almost normal. Just kidding. It's not that bad. Um, being honest to God or understanding who you are in Christ, and that's why I covered that first last week, and then today I can talk about this. It's because being honest to God means you're honest to Him about your fears. Listen, guys, the worst thing you could do before God in your Christian life is fake it. That's the worst thing you could do. The worst thing you could do is think that you have to cover up for yourself because God will be disappointed otherwise. That's the worst that you could do. And there's going to be millions and millions and millions of the majority of Christians who will live out this way. Who will only feel okay interacting with God when they have it all together. Who will only feel okay interacting with God if they've done well. But very hard and very difficult. Would you find it okay to interact with God in the midst of your failures? In the midst of your fears? So the perception that you need to knock out or what I'm trying to get to, what needs to be demolished today is to think that only uprightness can be addressed with God. Because with God, you can actually be honest in your fears. God, I know you're my provider, but I'm afraid I'm going to go broke. I'm afraid. Help me in my fear. God, I know you work all things for the better of those who love you. 
but I don't know if I'll make it through this one. This deal that I'm working on, this homework, this project, this next move, my applications, you know, I know that it's going to work out, or I want to believe that it's going to work out, but I'm afraid it won't. Honest to God. Your life is never separate or apart from Him, from His presence. It's not just a Sunday thing. You're never apart from Him. Yesterday, Bob was his name. The preacher, he said, um, he was talking about other things, and he said, you know, I, I heard this whisper from God, and then he stops and he says, and he says, um, something along the lines, he says, you know why God whispers? And everybody's like, no, he didn't know he whispers. He says, because he wants to show you how close he is. But you can only hear someone when they're whispering if they're close. If they're that near. And so God is near, even in your fears. So be, you can be honest to God in your fears. Even if it goes against, you know, I, I've had the, the circumstance, or I've been in a picture, I've been in a room with people who say, you know, if you're doubting, if, you, if you're doubting, if you don't have faith, you're going against God because the one thing that pleases God is faith. To which I would say, I agree. But my human heart fails. And so you mean to tell me that when I'm afraid that I don't have faith for something, God dislikes me? No, the answer is no. The answer is, he wants you to believe. He wants you to be up there with him in faith. But if you're not, he doesn't walk away. He sits on the floor with you until you're ready to get up and believe. So you can be honest with God in your fears next. Just as um, David did. You can be honest with God in your favors. You can talk about fading, man. This guy murdered someone who was innocent, and he still goes to God. I mean, this is a paradox. This is, this is just the thing that doesn't make sense. And to a lot of people who are against Christianity, this is the kind of stuff that bothers them because it seems unjust. I, I never did anything wrong, which is the worst thing you can think, by the way. And this guy that killed someone, you mean to tell me they can come to God? The answer is, unfortunately, for the person that got hurt, the answer is yes. But fortunately for the offender, the answer is yes. Because there's two things, there's two big things and, and two different approaches to life. Two different stands. And, and some days you're going to get to experience one of these stands and the next day you're going to get to experience the other stands. But there's no avoiding them. You're either on one side or you're on the other side. All the time. Forever in life. You're either the offender or the one that watched the offense happen. When you're the offender, this makes a whole lot of sense. And you actually want this. You can, I want to be able to be honest with God when I've been the offender because I want to be forgiven. There's no one around on earth that goes around thinking, I don't want to be forgiven. Unless, of course, they're mentally gone and, and no longer fully there. Or secondly, you could be someone that says, I can't believe God's about to forget, forgive that person. You're either the one that needs the forgiveness or you're on the side of saying, I hope God doesn't forgive that. Because that was wrong. And I said yesterday, as, I, as we're having lunch, and I'm sitting down with, with, um, with uh, a, a guy from this, from this um, uh, that, that, that works with, with youth at this specific campus, at this specific church. I sat down and he says, what, you, what did you think about the conference? And I said, you know, it, it was a relief to me because... Or it was, it, it joined in on what I already understand, which is the gospel. You know, they said something, the gospel isn't fair. The gospel isn't for good people. The gospel is for bad people. And I said to him, you know, and it felt, it was hard because the story was pretty dramatic. I mean, you guys should have been there. It's pretty dramatic. They should make this into a movie. But I said to him, so I, I'm at peace today. I feel, I feel like, great. What a reassurance. You know, I, I shed my tears and I felt God's love right there and then as, as, as they were praying and, and, and wrapping up the first session and the second session. And I said, but you know what troubles me? 
I said to the guy, you know, you know who's going to have a difficult time dealing with something like this? It's someone who feels self-righteous. Someone who feels like, I should have never forgiven that woman. Someone who feels like, no, 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 I've done bad things, but not that bad of things. Someone who feels that way and views life that way could not reconcile with this story. They're going to have a hard time reconciling this story. And then he says to me, yeah, sort of like the prodigal son story. And I said, yeah. I said, the, the, the one that's the offender is the one that comes home saying, God, Father, I've sinned against you. Forgive me. I'll be one of your slaves. Just let me back in the house. And the dad says, dude, you're not going to be a slave. You're my son. Put a robe on this guy. Welcome him back in. We're going to kill the biggest calf out there. We're going to have a lunch for this guy because my son was dead, but now he's alive. But then at, that, at the end of the story, right before the story ends, you see that ugly little head pop out of self-righteousness. And it's the brother, the one that never left, the one that did things right, the one that, that obeyed the father, the one that never left. He's mad. And he says, Babe, I've been here the whole time. You've never had a party like this for me. And we concluded in our conversation, that's who's not going to get it. People like that will have a forever hard time understanding that you can be honest to God in your favor and that He's still going to love you. It's people who feel like, I haven't done that many bad things. When God says, No, all of you guys have failed, all of you guys deserve wrath. So be honest to God in your favors. Be honest to God. Never think that your life is apart from Him. On your darkest hour, He is present. On your best moment, when you're doing the best deed you've ever done, when you're feeding hungry people, when you're praying for someone who's down, when you just kept someone from taking their own lives, God is there. And the night that you decided to go off the cliff, and go away from the thing that you believe to be right, God is still there. Now there's consequences for that. And David has some consequences. Actually, we'll take a look at that next week. Because sin does come packaged with a whole bunch of baggage. But you can be honest to God in your favors. And know that He is not wishy-washy. He is in flaky. And you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to do something wrong. Some weeks will be rougher than others. Some weeks will be better than others. But you can be honest with God about who you are. There's no surprises to Him. Next slide. Be honest to God in your dreams and goals. See, God is not apart from... It's not just a do and a don't. It's an are. It's a who you are. And what you do. And God is interested and you can be honest with him about your dreams and your goals. God, I really want to be a doctor. Include him in that. God, I really want to get into this school. Include God in that. God, you know what? I've said it, I've said it in recent weeks. God, I really want to finish this project. I really want to get to the end goal. I have dreams for this, 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 uh, this startup. Be honest with God in your dreams and goals. God will give you clarity. God will nudge your heart. And when there's agony and when there's lack of peace, God will come to the rescue. You know, I think it's unfortunate for people that think that when something doesn't work out, that, that God was the, the creator of bad in the story. There's a lot of people that walk around like that. There's a lot of people that walk around, oh, if you got sick, if you got, you know, I, I, I've heard stories of people saying, well, I moved cities. And then I had a really, like, I, I, got, I, I got into, you know, a financial difficulty when I got to the new city. And I've heard people say, yeah, because God never wanted you to move. To which I think, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you're in a brand new city, it's almost obvious that you might struggle a little bit financially. Because you don't know anybody, you probably got to get a brand new apartment, you probably got to look for a job. It makes logical sense to say, You'd probably be broke for a couple of months until you can find a job. To which other people who don't know God, who don't understand the gospel, or don't understand God's heart towards people, will say, yeah, God didn't want you to move. You jumped the gun. I mean, I've heard the whole shebang. At this, at this point with caffeine and a lot of things that I've done, I've heard it all. Maybe God didn't want you to do something. I think to myself, well, 
Hey, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the brightest. Starting a business is taking a lot of money. Maybe that's the reason why I ran out. It's because they take a lot of money. It's not because God's against it. It's not because God is, is, again, God is not against your dreams and your goals. And that's why be honest with him about them. Now, if your dreams and goals involve hurting others, then you might want to reconsider. You know, if your dreams and goals include hurting your neighbor, you might want to reconsider. Because above all things, Jesus said, love God, oh, by the way, and love people, because it's just as important. You want to demonstrate you love God, you've got to love people. You don't love people, ah, it's really hard to say if you love God. If your dreams and goals, if they even aspire to do something good, I don't see a problem with it. You aspire to do something that's going to hurt your neighbor, I might want to reconsider. And this is why we share it with God. God will give you clarity. Because in the darkness, when no one is watching, God is still there. And in the depths of your heart, whatever it may be, God understands and knows it. And if it's heading the wrong direction, because God loves you so much, He will step in and try to put you on the right track. And if it's heading in the right direction, even when trials come, God is behind you saying, go ahead. There's nothing I cannot overcome. Understanding your life, in this sense, being honest with God, is the most powerful thing we can go across to me. We don't have to hide from him. That when we're wrong, we're wrong. And I remember being a kid, I was being younger, and wanting some things my way, because I knew deep down inside there was a sin that I could hide back there. And I wanted it so bad. And you know why I would keep it from God? Because I knew it was bad. You know why I wouldn't pray about it? God, help you out of this. Because I knew it was bad. I knew there was sin packaged at the end of the story. But even then, I can be honest with God. Then I allow for His Spirit to come in and be part of the thing that stops me from going in the wrong direction. So it's a safe, safe play. Lastly, you can only be honest if you trust Him. Only be honest if you trust Him. And in Psalm chapter 3, Verse 1 and 6. Verse 1 to 6. David puts it this way. Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. Talk about agony. In fact, the one that was against me was his son Absalom. Because he wanted to take the kingdom from him. Now listen, it's one thing to have conflict with people who are outside of your household. But another thing is to have your people in your closest side of the family being against you. And this is what David is experiencing. And he says this, so many are saying God will never rescue him. If you want to be honest, you have to trust him. Because there will be lies that are spoken to you apart from God. There will be people that say, oh, God's not with you anymore. Oh, God is disappointed in you. And this is what David was hearing. And there are many people that talk like that don't understand God. They don't get it. They understand that they're in a very deep hole. That the only way about it is to understand, hey, I'm as guilty as you are, just in a different form. Hey, I need God as desperate as you need God, just in a different form. I'm just in a different hole, but we're still in holes. And listen to this. He says, but you, O Lord, you have to be, you have to trust them in order to be honest with them. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. It doesn't feel like it right now, God. I'm hiding. I'm, I'm in this cave hiding because I'm afraid that these guys are going to find me and kill me. I'm not in my palace. I'm not where I should be. But God, you are still my shield. It doesn't feel like it, but you are still my shield. This is what it looks like to trust God. And he says, you are my glory, the one who holds my head. I can't hold my own head. I'm not fighting for my own glory. The only thing to boast about that David had was God, not even his kingdom. He knocked down Goliath and he didn't boast about it. He said, well, the only reason that happened is because God allowed it to happen. And he goes on and he says, I cried out, cried out to the Lord. 
And he answered me from his holy mountain. Verse 5, I lay down and slept. Yet I woke up in safety. For the Lord was watching over me. Only reason why you can be honest is because God is a secure God. But you have to trust that. You have to trust that in order to live a full transparent life before the eyes of God. He sees it all, but one thing is for him to understand that he sees it all, and another thing is to understand I can tell him everything. And listen to this. Yeah, I woke up and said, because the Lord was watching me. In verse 6, I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. I'm not afraid. Why? Because I trust you, God. Now, I could get, I could, I might be killed in the midst of this battle. And he was this close to being murdered, David. Gotta read uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. You have to read it. It's a huge, huge uh, picture of, wow, it was very scary to be David. And then he made some dumb decisions, so it just got even nastier. This close to being murdered. I don't think he's saying that he's not afraid of tens of thousands of enemies because he feels that he's strong. In fact, at the beginning of this passage, he understands just how vulnerable, how weak he is. And he's crying out to God, man, I have so many enemies, so many people that want to come get me. But you are my rock and my shield. So the reason, and this may draws me to conclude, the reason why he's not afraid is because he knows. Beyond this life, beyond what happens to me physically here, God, you are still there to catch me on the other side. And that's a, a thing for, for, for another day. A, number one, be honest with God, with your fears. Two, one, just because your faith fails you, doesn't mean God will. Listen, I'm a pastor of you know, this church. I've been involved in ministry for a while. But there's been doubts. I've had my moments where I'm just like, damn, am I going the right way? Is God present here? And yet God didn't come out and completely discard me. There are situations, in fact, that I go through or I feel like, wow, he's so near. Because if he wasn't, I would have been knelt down from this. So number one, be honest with God with your fears. God, I'm afraid that I won't believe. God, I'm afraid that I will jump off and not continue on this road of faith. So hold on to me. Because I can't hold on to myself. Number two, be honest with God. Uh, be honest to God about your favors. God, I've sinned and, and I don't have plans. I'm not sinning anymore. So help me. This isn't right. This isn't correct. I'm not going the right way. Be honest with God about your dreams and your goals. If they're twisted, if they're wrong, God will find you out and God will put you on the right track. He loves you for crying out sake. He won't let you go down the wrong road. And lastly, in order to do this, you have to trust Him. You have to trust him. You have to believe that he is. That he has been and that he will be. That he was, he was after you before you acknowledged him. That he's with you today. And that one day when your body vanishes. Last, yesterday we, we watched Coco. Have you guys watched Coco? You guys got to watch it. It makes you cry. You know? it, had the, it had a sobbing. It was bad. I was like, I didn't want to look. Jen was like, over here. My mom's like behind me. Lucas is right here. I don't want to turn around and like look at him because I'm crying. I'm falling. And then Luca, and then I turn around and I see Lucas. He just doesn't care. So. <laughs> he just sees the flying dog or whatever. Then I thought about something. I said, man, we're, you know. And then living with an, with an elderly person, uh, like my wife's grandma, it, it makes it more real. It's like, dude, we're all heading towards our deathbed one day. And now we don't want to focus on that too much because it can get us down. But the truth is, we're all going to die one day. But even on that day, when we no longer are here, guess who's waiting for us? To take us to the very place that he promised to keep us in forever and ever. It's him. 
It's him. Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Practice on this deep back this week. In the car, in the middle of the classroom, when you're about to be, uh, you know, when you're about to go to work, or you're about to go to sleep, or you're about to head to the school, be honest with God. Practice that. Practice understanding that He's present all day long. Whether your honesty is, God, I'm frustrated. God, I'm afraid. God, I feel so happy. God, I really like this person. God, I don't like this other person. Honest to God. With the angle of knowing that he will put you on the right path. If you're honest with him, and there's nothing that keeps you from drawing to him, he will put you on the right place at the right time. So Father God, I pray today for just a trust that will develop in our hearts and grow in our hearts. God, that every situation that we're in, God, we can include you in. And that would give us rest. That would give us peace, God. Because it's so hard, so hard to think that, or to, 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 to understand life as something we have to do on our own. That, that can be so difficult. That can be so overwhelming. Now, I'm not saying we want to be neglectful. I pray that my brothers and sisters will still study for their exam. That they won't just pray a prayer and hope that they get them all right when they haven't studied. That's not what I'm talking about. But in those hours of crunch time, those, those minutes of feeling like, wow, this is about to start, I have studied, but I don't remember anything, God, may we come to you then. May we be fully honest, fully transparent, fully exposed to Almighty God. We already are, but do we know that we are? And that's what's important. So, Father, I pray for, for just... Uh, a joyful rest of Sunday. I pray for peace, God. I pray for healing. God, I pray for families in Florida. Father, I just pray for, for, for our country. I never do this, God. Perhaps I've turned a bit cynical towards it. Today, Father, I want to repent from that. I just want to lift up to you this nation. All the people being affected. By, whether it's mass shootings or just the lack of love and the lack of peace that a lot of people feel. I pray for comfort. And I pray, God, that we would, the church would lift up prayers that will move your hand into action in this country. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.